There we go. Fantastic. OK. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming along this afternoon. It's my first time at Golang UK. So um, I'd just like to thank the organizers for what's been a fantastic day so far. And I'm looking forward to tomorrow, not least because I'll have finished my talk then and I'll be able to relax. Um, so I'm co-founder of a startup called ModLogic. And what we're looking to do is build a financial modeling platform, ultimately to replace Microsoft Excel. But given the subject of financial modeling seriously runs the risk of sending this room to sleep, we're going to talk about something else today. We're going to talk about using Go to build front-end apps that run in the browser. So why are you sitting here today? Maybe you've tried a bit of JavaScript programming and immediately just ran a mile, because there's no types. The nuances of the language, the plus operator being overloaded about 20 different ways, uncontrolled dependencies, Maybe you're concerned your JavaScript project is running out of control, that the cost of updates or refactors are too high. Maybe it's hard to bring new people into your team because the project is running out of control. Finding it difficult maybe to increase the velocity of the team, i.e. The, the rate at which you're um, producing new features. Maybe you're fighting the language tooling. Really, the list goes on. But you're a bit stuck because JavaScript is the only language if you actually want to make the front end of your nice web app, which has got to go back end, interactive in any way, shape, or form. So today, what are we actually going to do? We're going to write a browser-based interactive front end app in Go, because it's a language we all know and love. We're going to use myitcv.io React, which is a wrapper around Facebook's React JavaScript library. We're going to learn to love Go Generate. And so if anybody's not used Go Generate before, you'll love it by the end of today. And as I said, we're going to enjoy to learn the benefits. We're going to enjoy the benefits of writing our front-end apps in Go, thereby solving many of the problems that I just listed with any project that is effectively written in JavaScript. And then we're going to end up, hopefully, with teams of happy front-end gophers. I'm not quite sure what the collective noun for gophers is, so I just use team there. So let's just quickly start with some definitions. For the purposes of this talk, what do I mean by front-end? I mean a browser or equivalent on a client device, which is rendering HTML and CSS. And that includes, by definition, something like GitHub's Electron, which is effectively, I'm going to be a bit loose here, a wrapper around a browser, or the V8 engine at least. For the purposes of this talk as well, the back end could be local, remote, or non-existent. I'm not actually going to dwell on that. We'll focus on the front end part, either bit that runs within the browser. We'll talk a tiny bit more about backends later on. So what do we mean by interactive? Arguably, all HTML pages are interactive, if you think about it, because you can click on a link, and that does something in response to you clicking on the link. So I haven't really found a good definition here, so I could equally be abusing the term in some way, shape, or form. But for the purposes of this talk, intra-page load responsiveness, i.e., on a page, you're clicking on the page in some way, and the page does something in response to you, either clicking or um, with a key press, for example. May or may not involve any back-end calls, but there's some visual change that happens to give you that feeling of interactivity. So what do we mean by an app? Again, for the purposes of this talk, it's either an HTML page or HTML pages that are interactive using those two definitions of front-end and interact we had before. If it's just one page, this is our sort of classic single-page application, which people may be aware of. If it's multiple pages, that just means we've got some, some of our app effectively split across multiple HTML pages. But why is any of this important? Well, the browser is an extremely good cross-platform way of building front-end apps. OK, you're not going to build huge amounts of complex logic in there. But it is cross-platform, and there are billions of devices that run browsers. And there's a fairly good um, equality in terms of their behavior from a JavaScript, HTML, and CSS perspective between those browsers. There's zero cost to adoption, really, in that someone just visits your site, which happens to be an application. You haven't had to do anything to put it in front of them. And there's a low cost from a development perspective as well. Or at least there should be. And that's sort of kind of the part of the problem we talked about with JavaScript is that that bar is maybe a bit higher with JavaScript. So hence why we're looking at doing this in Go. So let's take a look at some examples of interactive front-end apps. And the context here is what you're looking at, and you saw it as I was just setting up the screen there, is that this presentation is within the browser. It's using the Go Present tool. 
And so what we're effectively looking at is an HTML page. And each of the slides that follow actually have an inline iframe within, the, within them. So there's a page within a page, which effectively allows me to show you these apps that are all written in Go within this, within this slide presentation. So let's have a look. Some very basic, so sort of, hopefully everybody can see this OK. Actually, let me just make this one bigger. There we go. That's a bit better. Very simple here. So we've got a drop down that allows us to choose a person, which is then driving in the, the details pane at the bottom there some information about that person. Very simple. And here we've got the button, which is allowing us to toggle. So some definition of state here, and the interactivity clearly is, in this case, from me clicking the mouse. Let me just get my cursor back over here. So in this example here, we've got a sort of uh, a text input up at the top here, which is simply rendering below it in a, in a div um, the markdown rendered version of that. So we can just put in some simple example here. So the interactivity here, from me, from me doing some key presses, the state in this application is effectively the text in the text box at the top. And it, there's a sort of functional rendering of that, again, using a browser-based markdown parser in the bottom there. Let's just sort of click onto the next slide here. The world-famous to-do app. So there's no back end to this application here. It's just simply entire. This is entirely client-side state, where you can sort of imagine we're preparing a payload that we would then persist to the back end via some sort of save or whatever call. That's not implemented here. All of the state here is within this front end, within the front end, i.e., within the browser application. Slightly more colourful example, and I'm very grateful at this point to. Ashley McNamara and Matt Ryer, who are talking about this application tomorrow. So I don't want to steal too much of their thunder, but I'm very grateful to them for allowing me to use it. This is very interactive. As you can see on the left-hand side of this app here, there is essentially a preview of the gopher we're trying to build. And the right-hand side is effectively the configuration part. So there's effectively some shared state between the left-hand side, which if we change the gopher body based on the right-hand side here, we're driving what's shown in the left-hand side here. So you can sort of start to imagine, OK, well, there's some state going on here, some interactivity based on the mouse click on the right-hand side here, and that sh state is being shared between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So th this is all client-side logic here. There's no server-side rendering involved here. So this, all of this logic is within a Go-based front-end app here. So the right-hand side also has some state of its own here as to which of these panels is open. And again, you can sort of start to see how, again, the interactivity lends itself to actually presenting a much more rich user interface to the user. And then, just because it's quite a bit of fun, we can shuffle that and create ourselves a couple of fun little gophers there. So again, entirely client-side, just a random number generator that is effectively giving us some various configurations of gophers there. Um, this next example is credited to TJ Holowaychuk, who gave me permission to actually use this. Um, it's a great tool that he's put together that allows you to effectively test the latency of your website from different geographies in the world. Very, very simple, but it's very effective to just make sure that your site is very accessible and quickly so from other places in the world. This is just randomly generated data now. So when I click on this, you saw there's no host in there, but it's randomly generating ping values, essentially, as if, they were being, as if my site was being accessed from California and elsewhere. So the key thing here is the dynamic part was not only me clicking to actually set, submit something, but then the HTML and the CSS, which was some sort of animation there. So again, it's a much richer interface that you're presenting to the user. So what's making all this HTML and CSS dynamic? The document object model is something that everyone in this room, or some people may be familiar with, but it's essentially a representation that, a representation that allows us to interact with a page that's been loaded, and control that. And JavaScript is the language that then allows us to manipulate that tree-based structure and put HTML elements in, take them out, change the CSS, which effectively gives that, us that interactivity that we've seen in all the previous examples there. 
As I said, this gives you this programmatic access to the structure of it, so that gives us the change in the structure, but also the style of it. We also saw that events can be attached to things, so when I click on a button, for example, I can then dictate what I want to happen when I click on the button, or when I have a key press within a text area, for example. But JavaScript, really? I thought actually this was, you, you thought this was the reason that we weren't talking about JavaScript today and we were going to be talking about Go. It is such a ubiquitous language, as I said, it is the scripting language that allows you to interact with the DOM in a browser. But as we, have, as we sort of heard at the introduction at the beginning, it's not something that scales particularly well. It's not something I would choose to do. Maybe you wouldn't choose to do it either. But it is the reality because it won the browser battle. And we can't escape that, unfortunately. It's easily picked up and learned. If you've opened up the developer tools console in Chrome, then you will also have sort of hacked around with a bit of JavaScript. Maybe you've changed the HTML elements that are within a page just to sort of mock up what your page would look like or could look like with a bit of dynamic, uh, with a dynamic aspect to it. It is being standardized via the ECMAScript process. And maybe there's a sort of tomorrow's world that is ASM.js and WebAssembly, possibly. I'm not going to talk about that too much today. I'm just going to assume that JavaScript is the thing that we ultimately have to, do, ultimately have to end up with at the end of our pipeline if we want to have an interactive front-end app. So what do we do in this situation? What's the option space if we want to build interactive front-end apps? This is a very incomplete list. JavaScript is obviously at the top of the list because that's what we have to end up with. Then there's effectively a myriad of other options that sort of sit in the middle there where you can compile from your favorite language to JavaScript. CoffeeScript is one that was mentioned by Miles in the previous presentation. TypeScript is one that a number of people may be familiar with. Familiar with. ClojureScript is another popular one. I think actually ClojureScript was what they used um, to write the CircleCI interfaces and any other languages as well, some of which may compile to either JavaScript, ASM.js, or WebAssembly, because there are already some WebAssembly implementations out there. But as I said, we're just going to focus on JavaScript here. And if I was to randomly, but not randomly, pick one from this list here, I'm going to pick TypeScript, because it's got the word type in, and that, from a sort of Go pro programmer's perspective, is actually something that's a positive thing. So this very brief and incomplete analysis here is based on two years of experience we have with a medium-sized TypeScript project um, that's written using the React framework, the React library. So this is our experience, and your experience here may vary. TypeScript is a type superset of JavaScript. That's the, the important thing to start with. And so that type slash compiler aspect to it already gives it a slightly more robust feel than JavaScript itself. So a tick against it in that respect. But then the, sort of the, the cracks start to appear from our perspective. Because it's a large language, there's a very extensive specification. There's a lot more edge cases when you have a large language like that, particularly when it comes to typing things. If you've got a large language and a large specification, it's much harder to write tools that work with the language, to manipulate the language, to code generate the language. There are a number of very painful hangovers from JavaScript. Because it's a superset of JavaScript, you still have hangovers in there, like the plus operator being able to operate on absolutely any value under the sun. And that's a bit of a problem, because in Go, we're not used to that. There's a myriad of compiler options. Um, and this is somewhat uh, a tribute, if you like, to the TypeScript folks, because they're trying to cater for people who are coming from lots of different backgrounds here. So almost it's something they had to do in some respects, but at the same time, it doesn't make for much fun programming, because you can't just pick up and go with it in a way that, as a Go programmer, you can. In our experience, we haven't got hugely high development velocity from that perspective, because we're sort of fighting all of these things along the way. Our app takes about six seconds to compile, and it's only a medium-sized project. So that's a bit of a problem from our perspective. And if I can just chuck in the grenade here that is the, the famous one, there's no single source of truth as far as formatting of code is concerned. Again, you've got a myriad of options as far as the, um, the code formatter for TypeScript is concerned. So it's not ideal on many fronts. Is there another way? Well, I've kind of given the punchline away on this already, because Go is the answer to this. But we ultimately have to end up with JavaScript at the end of our pipeline. 
So this is where the gopher comes in. But how do we go from Go code to JavaScript? This is where Gopher.js comes in, and that's something that folks may have heard of. So what is Gopher.js? It's a compiler that takes Go code, and it gives us JavaScript, as simple as that. It's an absolutely outstanding project. It really is. And the target of the focus of Gopher.js is to give you JavaScript you can then run within the browser, which is a massive tick in terms of what we're trying to do today. Ricard Musiol and uh, the team uh, have done a superb job. Um, I think it was sort of conceived back in 2012-ish. And Dmitry Shiralyov and Richard have actually got a number of really good presentations on YouTube that explain Gopher.js in a bit more detail. So I'd encourage you to take a look at those. But what does Gopher.js actually support? Because that's critical. It actually has pretty much full language coverage, including Go routines, which is a bit weird because JavaScript in and of itself, all of the engines are single-threaded. And yet, in Go, we have concurrency um, where it's available to run on multi-core CPUs. But it's effectively simulated within the transpiled JavaScript. So we have full coverage from the language perspective. We've got almost entire standard library at our disposal as well. So just think, writing any Go code, compiling it to JavaScript, and then just having that available within the browser. Absolutely fantastic. The performance is pretty good in most cases as well. And actually, the example that exists on the Gopher.js website is that there's an HTML5 gaming engine, which is effectively proof of that which is great. Source map support is hugely useful. That is, you've compiled from Go to JavaScript. You're running that JavaScript within the browser. You can set a breakpoint in Go code in your browser to effectively debug what's actually going on. So that's hugely powerful, particularly where you've maybe got some sort of nuances of what's then going on within the browser. There's a DOM package, and that wraps effectively the JavaScript API to access the DOM. So from Go code, you can access the DOM, i.e. the browser's object model of the HTML page we're looking at, and manipulate it directly. And there's a JavaScript interoperability package as well, which effectively opens the door for us to be able to access the millions and millions of JavaScript packages that exist out there already. And actually, we saw from Steve's um, presentation earlier on today that JavaScript is still a hugely popular language. And so it's unsurprising that there's this wealth of packages and libraries that exist out there that we can use. So we can, run, we can write Go code. We can compile it to JavaScript so that it runs in the browser. This is great. As I said, there are lots of existing JavaScript libraries out there. And we want to take advantage of those instead of just reinventing the wheel. And this is where React comes into things. Now, React is hugely popular in and of itself. If, if one's to go by sort of GitHub stars, there's 75,000 stars on the React package alone, which makes it hugely popular. But it's also, from my perspective, actually a really good pattern for developing front-end apps as well. This is, as I said, it's something that we use in our project, our existing TypeScript project, excuse me. So what is React and why React? It's a library for building user interfaces. And it presents this nice abstraction of the DOM, which is a very elegant thing, because actually directly manipulating the DOM can be very, very slow and a costly thing, because it's essentially re-rendering something on screen. And it, it's not actually, it, that doesn't actually allow you to structure your application in a particularly nice way if you're directly manipulating the DOM. Um, it's very pragmatic at the same time, because it doesn't actually mandate any data or state patterns. And if you've done any sort of React programming or something in Angular, for example, you, you'll appreciate that. Um, but at the same time, that's actually a really important thing because it's not prescriptive about, and you must create your model like this, you must update your state like that, unless with it, it's just within a component. So that's a real plus point from our perspective. So this nice abstraction of the DOM is a good thing. It's very pragmatic, and it's extremely widely used. So you can write a React component and then effectively use it as you would a Go package within your application as well. So it's easy to share these things. There's a nice element of reuse going on there. So let's just briefly look at the fundamentals of React. And components are the fundamental building block of React. It's a description of, at any point, what, you actually, what HTML or other components you want to render. And we do that via the render method on a component. Props, if you want to, are effectively the parameters to that component, i.e., what arguments does this, actually, does this component actually need to work? 
State is optional as well, and that's effectively private to a component. Sometimes these components need some sort of state in order to actually work properly. As I said before, the updating the DOM can be a costly thing. So this is where React presents this concept of a virtual DOM, which is much cheaper to maintain. So it uses these components as building blocks, which are effectively descriptions of what we want to be rendered. And React builds up this shadow representation of the DOM, which is called the virtual DOM, and then takes care for us of actually updating the real DOM so that we have rendered on screen what we ultimately want. So how do these components describe what should be rendered? As I said, it's via the render method, which ends up being a function, a pure function, of a component's props and state. And as you can see here, it results ultimately in a hierarchy of components and HTMLs. And HTML, excuse me. So here, the outer def component, actually within its render function here, renders a div, and that div contains a preview component and a chooser component. And you can see the preview component in its render function renders some nested divs, some images, et cetera, et cetera. You get the idea. And this is effectively the hierarchy that we get built up. And if you look and um, right click on a page in Chrome, for example, and say inspect, you'll be very familiar with this sort of structure. OK, so how about combining Go4JS and React? Well, this is where the package that I've written called myitcv.io React comes in. So what is it? It's a set of Go4JS bindings for Facebook's React, and it, ra and, and it wraps excuse me, Facebook's JavaScript library. And the goal here is to present as Go-like as possible an interface to declaring components, props, and state. Along with the package itself is a tool called ReactGen that helps just get started very quickly by initializing a new project, but also it acts as the, a code generator to help us along the way, and we'll see that in a second. So let's get straight into this by looking at how we create an interactive front-end app in Go. So this is going to be the ubiquitous Hello World app here. We're just going to create ourselves a directory, change into that directory, and run ReactGen to just create ourselves a simple um, example here using the Bootstrap template. So there's a whole load of assumptions here about the tooling, etc that I'm not going to go into now. This, this is all well linked to from the wiki and my blog posts, which are at the end of the slides, and I'll make those available. So let's just assume that React Gen is available, is in our path, et cetera. So what does this ultimately look like if we just ran this? And again, this is live within the browser here because it's an iframe that's rendering. So this is what you would get ultimately if you ran up this example here. Not very exciting at the moment. So what did React Gen in its init mode here actually give us? Well, it gave us four files, a couple of Go files, index.html, and what looks like some sort of generated Go file as well. So let's pick this apart. Now, let's just remember that here we're talking about something that's loaded within a browser. So an HTML file is effectively the entry point for our application, i.e., that's the thing that gets loaded by the browser. And then everything that's within the HTML page is effectively loaded as a side effect of that. As you can see down at the bottom there, the script tag is one th such thing that is effectively a side, side effect. And hello world.js here is the compiled JavaScript result of those Go files that you saw being generated. I'll just point out as well that we've got a div that's in the middle there that is identified by the app ID. And we'll come back to that in a second. Let's just remember, but this is the just general structure here, just a boring HTML file that happens to load as a side effect, the Gopher.js compiled JavaScript. Let's take a look at main.go. As its name suggests, this file is part of a main package, and we can sort of argue afterwards about whether it should be called main.go. But as a result of this being a main package, Gopher.js then runs the main function as a side effect of that script having been loaded. So we've got the index.html as effectively the entry point, and then this main function gets run as a side effect of us having loaded that script. A couple of things to point out here is the we're using the DOM package here, um, and we're using that DOM package to get hold of um, a reference essentially to the document, the, the DOM document. And then, as you can see, we're using the document to actually get at that div that I pointed out that's identified by the app ID there. And then what we're doing is we're handing off to React at this point to say, I want to render a component called app. 
within that DOM element there. And so we hand off to React at this point, and we'll come on to that in a second. So let's, took a, let's just take a quick look at this app component. We'll come on to components more a bit later on. This is the definition of an app component here, app def at the top here, and we'll look at that naming strategy in a second. The bottom there, you can see the definition of what it actually means when we render an app component. Well, no real surprises here. It renders an H1 element along with a paragraph element with exactly the text that you saw um, on a few slides earlier on. So there's one more file here that was generated by React Gen. Let's take a look at what that one is. And that's something that sort of suggests that it's been generated and has something to do with React Gen. And again, we can talk about naming strategies afterwards. But this comes about as a result of the Go Generate tool seeing the directive Go Generate React Gen in the main.go file that was generated here. Now, there's an excellent blog post from, I think it was around 2014, that Rob Pike gave. Uh, it was a talk as well, where he introduced the Go Generate tool. It's part of the Go tool chain, not something that you would necessarily have used. And we'll just come on to look at what Go Generate actually does in a, sec in a second. But what's React Gen actually doing here? Well, it's generating a whole load of glue, co glue code for us between our component props and state de declarations and the wrapped React library. It's running at the package level in this main package that we've generated. So it's looking at all of the Go files that are within that main package and generating something as a result. And the thing that it's generating for us are type-safe methods, and we'll see these in a second, that effectively just save us writing a whole load of boilerplate code. So let's just take a slight detour to look at GoGenerate and what is GoGenerate actually doing. Well, th there's, there's a phrase that I've attributed to Rob Pike, but I, I'm not entirely sure whether that's correct that code generation is all about writing code to write less code. And that's perhaps a real sort of truism, but it's what we ultimately want to be doing. We don't want to be writing boilerplate code again and again just for the sake of it, particularly if it follows some sort of methodology. And so this is where code generation comes in, and this is where Go Generate, the tool, comes in as well. So you're starting with a Go source file, and you can end up with something. It doesn't matter what, but you're starting with Go source code. And that's what the directive, as you can see at the top there, is a special comment, essentially, slash, slash, go, colon, generate. That directive there is something that Go generate understands. And then it runs the command and any arguments afterwards that follow. As I said, there's more details in that blog post from, I think, it's December 2014. So I use code generation the whole time. And I actually have it running, uh, have such a requirement on it that I actually have a file watcher that's looking to see whenever any of my files change and then automatically reruns Go Generate as I save a file. So that just enables me to really streamline my development um, process. So, with that brief sojourn to Go Generate completed, let's take a look at writing our own React component because that's what we're, it's all about today. So using the generated, the initialized app that we have as a starting point, let's create ourselves a simple component. So as you saw from the app component previously, components are defined as struct types that have a def suffix, def name suffix. And that struct type just has to have a single embedded field of the type React component def. That's just a way of signaling to the code generator, this is a component. The combination of that name suffix and the embedded field there. So there we go. We've just declared ourselves a component here. And the code generator will see that. So if we save that file, something would happen. And we'll come on to what happens in a second. But let's just take a look now at creating a props for this, i.e., these are going to be the arguments that this component effect effectively accepts. Props in the same type of way are a struct type that use a props name suffix. And then you can see here, we called our component foo bar. So this is the props type is going to be foo bar props. And again, the code generator detects this component now has a corresponding props type. This props type is not very exciting here. It is effectively just a single field called name of type string. Nothing very exciting here. We're also going to give this component some state. No surprises for guessing what the name suffix for the state type is. It's again a struct type that has the state suffix. And in this situation, it's just going to be very, very dull, and it's going to have an age field of type int in this situation. So let's just assume we put all of this within one file. It could be within multiple files. And we've saved those files, and we've had 
um, go generate run, either as a result of a file watcher or we've just run it manually. So what's React Gen done for us at this point? Remembering that our component is called foobar and that the component struct type is therefore called foobar def, React Gen has generated for us an, a load of code, but the most important three methods that it's actually generated are type safe methods to get at the props and the state and change the state from the component's perspective. So you can see here, we have the, the implementation here is sort of just omitted. This is effectively the doc level. But within any other method that we write on the foobar def component, we can then get at the props and we'll get back the instance of foobar props that is the current props for that component. The same with state. And set state is just a way of the component effectively telling React, well, my state has now changed. And of course, that needs to be type safe in exactly the same way. So this is what the code generator gives us. So let's quickly now look at well, what we want our component to actually do. And we effectively describe that via the render method here. And as I said before, the render method is a function of state and props. So the two lines that are highlighted, highlighted at the top there are just the way of sending wherever we are rendering at the moment. Let me just put into a name variable the name part of the props, the same for age from the state. And then we just create ourselves a nice little detail string. Again, you can just see we're using the standard library here, the fumpt package, to actually create ourselves a formatted string in this way. And then the bit at the bottom there is the crux of the render method, because we're saying, well, this is going to be a div that contains a paragraph, which includes a string that is the detail string that we've just built up there. And then beneath the paragraph, we're just going to have a button. And that button is going to have the words bump age written on it. And guess what's going to happen when we click on that button? We'll look at that on the next slide here. So this is the click handler that we're actually using here. It's defined as another helper type, effectively, that wraps, as you can see, um, the foobar def component type here. Now, this has to implement um, one, sing one interface, this type, to, in order to be able to pa be passed to the buttons on click parameter field. And that is the on click method, unsurprisingly. So it's just an interface with a single method in, which is on click, and it has that signature there, synthetic mouse event. So in the same way here, we're just getting the state, we're bumping the age, and we're effectively telling the component, your state has now changed. And that state change will cause the component to re-render. So how do we use this component? Well, of course, we've seen the type declaration for the component but we can't actually use it, and so actually calling foobar def would be quite odd as well. So we simply create ourselves a constructor function that follows the naming strategy of the function itself being the name of the component. Hence, we call this foobar. Foobar has a props type, so unsurprisingly, we're going to pass in an instance of the props in this situation, and then we just hand off to another code-generated function in this situation. We don't need to worry about the details of that today. So you could just literally follow this pattern here, um, and that would, this would just work absolutely fine for you. OK, so that's the declaration complete. Let's use our component within the app that we initialized earlier on. OK, so if you remember, app.go was the, what the, the file that was generated for us by React Gen in it. So we're now just going to modify that by putting in the text in bold here, which is using the constructor function to create a sales effectively an instance, if you like, of the foobar component. And we're going to pass in the props here with the name Peter in this situation. So we're editing the file that was created for us all the way back in the init phase. We're now just adding in this component here, so it's going to appear after the paragraph. But you can see how this is nicely composing. We're just, just building, effectively, the hierarchy of components uh, that we want to appear on the page. So what does this actually look like? Very exciting. We have, my name is Peter. Unsurprising, because effectively, that's the detail string, if you remember it. It's using a function of the props, which was the name, and the age, which the zero value of is effectively zero for the integer field. And when we click on bump page here, it's bumping the age. So as I said, clicking on that, the event handler, if you remember it, just causes the state to be effectively transitioned to the previous state with the age incremented by one. 
very exciting. Um, so another really cool thing about wrapping an existing library which has got really good tooling is that actually we can reuse a lot of the tools that already exist. So I said to you before, with the compiled JavaScript, you can not only use the debugger and step through things, it looking at Go code, the Go code that compiled to the JavaScript, but React also has a huge suite of tools available where you can then look at the structure of your React application. So you can see here, I've opened the Chrome developer tools, and I've switched to the React tab, having installed those developer tools, and now I can see the structure of my app in terms of React components and the HTML elements that they actually render. So you'll recognize this is the, the example that we're looking at here, not least from the top part up there, but we've got the app def, the app being the outer component, which renders the div, which contains an h1, a p element, and then what follows is the foobar component that we've just defined as part of this. So this takes us back to an example that we saw briefly earlier on, and let's remind ourselves of what this looks like. This is the gopherize.me example that's been rewritten using Go with these React wrappers. So the left-hand side, as we said, is sort of a preview component. The right-hand side is a chooser component that has a number of panels. Okay, and those panels, as we saw, the state can be open, closed, and there's also a little border there around the currently selected item within that panel. So let's just look at this from a sort of pictorial representation of what this looks like in terms of our React app. There's this outer component, a preview component that it renders, and a chooser component. And within the chooser component, you could see that we're actually rendering a number of different panels. So this is the overall structure of it. It's the outer panel in this situation that actually holds the state for our application. What is the current gopher? And what is the config for our application? That state that can, that that state then gets passed to the preview component and the chooser components as props. So as you can see, the preview component takes a gopher as effectively one of its parameters, or arguments, if you will. So does the chooser. The chooser also takes the config. The chooser also takes some sort of event handler for when we want to update the gopher. So if you remember, when we click on something within a panel, we are effectively trying to cause the state of the current gopher to change in some way. So we need to be passed a handler within the chooser component, which we can then also pass to each of the panels as well. So you can see that sort of that, that um, event handler essentially getting passed from a chooser also down to a panel as well. So the chooser component also has some state as well that you saw as to which of those panels is actually open. And hence, that just need only be something as simple as an integer in this situation. So, I won't go into the detail of the, the panel props there, but you can sort of guess from the name of each of those fields there what it actually is. Open indicates whether the panel is opened or closed or not. And then within the panel's render function, based on the value of that props, it decides to render either the panel open or closed. As simple as that. But where does this config come from? I've just sort of mentioned config for the first time here, but where does it actually come from? This serves as a nice sort of segue to talking about backends and where we actually get data into our front-end application, because they don't just exist in isolation. But before talking about that, let's just remind ourselves of where we stand. We've written ourselves an interactive front-end app in Go. We've used myitcb.io React bindings around the React, um, Facebook's React JavaScript library. And we've also got to hand, got to hand excuse me, got to use Go Generate a bit, along with React Gen, to help just generate a whole load of boilerplate code along the way. We therefore have a newfound love for Go Generate, but we don't have any data in our application. Excuse me. So what's the option space for backends, i.e. to get this data into our application? Well, clearly the first option is to have no backend at all. But then not forgetting we have the entire Go standard library at our disposal, almost entire, we could just decide to get that configuration from a JSON REST-based API. We could speak to a service that is HTTP 1, Base64 encoded protobuf. We could speak to a gRPC backend over HTTP 2. Just You can keep listing all these options off. We web sockets, the whole lot. So gRPC sounds like a fun example. So let's look at a live example within the presentation of a gRPC backend. 
So again, just to put this in context, this is a front-end interactive app written in Go that is talking to a Go-based gRPC backend live within this presentation here. It all ha happens to be running on my laptop here. It doesn't matter where the backtop is actually, back end is actually running. So as I said, this is a Go gRPC backend. It's using the improbable gRPC web implementation. And this is all therefore based on protobuf declarations, ultimately. So very, very simply, um, what we're going to do here is I'm going to look at the right screen. So actually, this is, I'm just going to paste this in here. And using the ISBN of a book here, again, there's a sort of click handler attached via the React application, which, given this ISBN, returns us the details from the Go gRPC backend. Very nice. Sort of seemed painless enough. And here, let's just type in George to find ourselves some books that are actually written by someone called George. Again, this is just calling a gRPC method in the back end, uh, and again, but you would never particularly know it from the fact that this is just a browser-based front end. So that's pretty much it. We've covered, as I said, writing a Go-based front end um, app that runs within the browser um, using the React wrapper. Uh, that is myitseba.io slash react. Um, it doesn't specify where you get your data from or how you get your data. That's really up to you, which I think is a nice thing. Um, and as Ashley and Matt have sort of kindly demonstrated, allows you to write rather cool interactive apps that run within your browser. Um, just a few quick thanks if you'll allow me to all of these people listed here uh, for their various support uh, in sort of making this actually happen. Um, all very much appreciated, Johan, particularly for creating um, a fantastic the, the, the gRPC backend example, um, which is a real sort of a meeting of really interesting technologies to my mind. Uh, Mathieu and Brad, um, this is actually being adopted within the Camly Store project, albeit slowly, um, which that's been a huge help to me because that's forced me to really iron out some of the um, rough edges. If you can iron out a rough edge, I'm not sure. Um, papered over the cracks, maybe that would be a better one. Um, so thanks to everybody for helping uh, in that respect. As I said, I promise that there's some links here, and I'll make the slides available um, as well so that you can actually click through and interact with them when it's hosted online as well. Um, but I think two minutes under, that's it for today. Thank you very much. I'll happily take any questions if anybody has any questions now. Um, the mic will come running from the back. Thanks, Theo. Hi. That Hi. Was, that was interesting. Um, Great, thanks. I spend most of my time with, with JavaScript. Usually 5% is coding, 95% is fixing it. <laughs> how, how do you find that um, with actually writing testable code or knowing that it, it's going to work? Um, that's a really good question. I suppose I don't, to be honest, I don't have any huge um, amounts of data to sort of reference in that respect. But I can, I, I'll answer the question like this. I'm just writing Go code like any other Go code. I can write tests like any other Go code, particularly from a sort of, dare I say, a sort of unit te test perspective. Um, browser interactivity testing is harder by definition because you're requiring some sort of interactive aspect to the testing. Uh, but it's still possible, and there's lots of JavaScript libraries out there that can no doubt be wrapped in a way to make that as painless as well. So it, the short answer is that I'm writing Go code, and therefore I'm not having to fight a lot of the, the, the sort of the problems that you described there. But I wouldn't want to put a, a number on it necessarily. I'd be tempted to say it's the other way around, um, as in I just spend all of my time writing code. Not that it works all of the time, <laughs> hence why I'm a bit, <laughs> a bit careful with my answer. But th that's the sort of the intention behind doing it in Go, is that you don't have to spend your time fighting the language or the tools, etc. And that's really the focus behind React Gen as well. I want to be very declarative in the way that I declare my components, props, and state, have a, the code generator take away a lot of the heavy lifting for me, and just write components that compose by definition very well. Thanks. Hiya, you said Hi. that you can use almost all of the standard library. I was oh. just wondering, what is it that you can't use? Uh, I knew someone was going to test me on this. 
Um, by definition, you can't do things that are file system based. Um, CGO is almost, again, by definition, something that you can't do. Um, Net HTTP as well. But effectively, there's an XHR based um, package that you can use in place of that. Anyone else who can shout out any suggestions on what else is not supported, please do. Uh, but you sort of get the gist. You, you have sort of full, almost full coverage. And it, it, there's um, documentation on the GovJS website that has effectively a coverage report, if I can call it that, of the packages that, are, that aren't supported. You know it's actually supported because all of the tests run within Go4JS as well. So that's how you effectively have that assurance that it is working as expected as well. It's a fantastic project. So this builds on the shoulders of giants in that respect. Thanks. One more. Thank you. Uh, are you using either Redux, Redux or Flux? No, um, I'm not. Um, but that could be something that you choose to use. That's actually the beauty of the React approach, to my mind, is that it doesn't mandate, oh, you have to use this approach for your models or your data. You, there was absolutely nothing that you saw within there that saw me having to create a model or anything like that. It's just a very declarative way of declaring your state and then rendering as a function of state and properties. That's it. If you want to use any of those, absolutely fantastic. I tend to prefer immutable data structures. Um, and so then it's very, very easy to uh, effectively reason about the semantics of your application if you have immutable data structures. And I, f I have a, uh, another code gen based package that helps me generate immutable data structures that I use within my applications for that. But you're not forced to use that or indeed anything else. Cool. Thank you very much. Feel free to grab me afterwards if you've got any other questions. Thank you.